Thank you for coming today. I'm Hyogun Lee from Samsung Electronics um, Graphics R&D Group. And today I will talk about the GPU watch. And then Game Engine talk will be followed by Smedis from Unity. <laughs> Let's begin. My first job at Samsung was to draw the navigation map. At that time in 2003, with a low-powered device, we did not consider the performance much. It was enough to get five frames frame per second for the navigation system. But today, even we have much powerful device and graphics APIs, but we should consider the performance more, more, and more. Because for the best experience to end users, the performance and power consumption, temperature management became more important. We have many performance monitoring tools, such as GameBench, Snapdragon Profiler, DS5, etc on mobile device. These tools help developers to optimize their game. And each of these tools has their own great characteristics, but they also have some inconvenience, such as uh, most tools need installation some packages on the device or in the PC, and need to connect in the PC to use it. They show the performance measuring result in connected PC, sometimes not even in real time. And several tools does not provide the full, cap full capabilities without root permission on the device. It makes it difficult sometimes for developers to optimize their games because of these inconveniences. We realized that we need a new one, more convenient and simple, light tools that, so that developers can use it easily anytime. We sh uh, it should be easy to use, no installation or no PC connection is needed, and it shows the performance result directly on the screen in real time and support same functionality without root permission. And in addition, support Vulkan and OpenGLS with the same functionality. So we made, oh sorry. We made our own tools named GPUWatch. GPUWatch is our brand name of performance monitoring tools. Let's look at how GPU watch is learning. When, when game is learning, GPU watch shows the performance result directly on the screen in real time. It shows several information, FPS information, CPU, GPU usage information, and some kind of GPU profiling information. Let's take a look at it one by one. In the left top corner, GPU watch shows the FPS information. It shows two data, the current FPS and average FPS. Average FPS is calculated averaging the latest 10 frames FPS. It shows the data in number as well as in graph form. The numbered data is updated in real time, and the graph, graph data is updated. The trend of the FPS variation. And because the current FPS and average FPS graph is overlapped together, you can compare both data's trend. And in this example, you can find that there is some frame drop happens like this. 
like this information that GPU has provide, developers can guess there may be whether there may be some performance defect or not. In the right top corner, GPU shows CPU uses and GPU uses. The CPU uses is a normalized value, not dependent on the current CPU frequency. But GPU uses is not, so we show the current GPU frequency together. Of course, these values are displayed with graphs together. And bottom of the screen, GPU actually shows the GPU profiling information of the specific frame. GPU actually captures a specific frame and shows some several information of that frame. And after several seconds passed, it captures another frame continuously. First, you can notice that what frame is captured by seeing the thumbnail and the frame number of the captured frame. In this example, GPU actually captures the 580 second frame, and it took 17.8 milliseconds to render that frame. And below, there are four graphs. The first green graph represents the render path of this frame. In this example, you can see this frame includes four render paths indexed from zero to three. And each render path shows the two data. The first data is the draw call count of each render path, and second data is the payload count of each render path. In this example, all the four render paths had the same draw call count, 37, and same payload count, 1056. And remain the three graphs is aligned in time together. They represent, they represent uh, timeline information. The first graph is render path timeline information, and remain the two graphs shows the GPU activities. The vertex activities in blue color and orange uh, fragment activities in orange color. For example, some frames show uh, fragment activity is heavy, then you, developers may guess that there may be some heavy shaders issues or, or not. So they can start the invest, investigation of optimizing their game. I introduced uh, briefly what the GPU actually is. For now, I will show how to use it by live demo. It's very easy. Uh, no installation, no extra installation or configuration is needed. In Galaxy device, go to the setting and go to the developer options. Then you can find GPU menus. Here. First, turn on the GPU Arch option to activate it. And second, select one application that you want to monitor. I will select the score here game. And se third, select rendering API Vulkan or OpenGLS that is used by the selected application. I selected Vulkan because score here is learning in Vulkan and go to home screen, then run that application. Then you can see, oh, sorry. So the score here, actually score here game is running both in Vulkan and OpenJLS sometimes. So I will try again. Like this. 
When game is running, g p r t shows the performance information in real time on the screen. You're progressing well. Let's see how you do taking free kicks. To bend your shots, simply curve your line you to the path of the ball. Current FPS and average FPS variation and end of pass variation. To use it, it's very easy. I think you, you may wonder where, can, where GPUART can be used. I will introduce the two basic use cases. First, it can be used, the GPUART can be used for performance optimization. Because as you saw before, GPUART is very easy to use. So developers can activate it whenever he needs. When he develop and compile one scene, then he can check the performance instantly with the GPU watch. Oh, sorry. Second, GPU watch can be used in the performance comparison. Because the GPU watch can be used on device and shows the performance result on screen directly in real time. You can activate it on various devices and compare among various devices with the same contents. And you can compare the same content performance among various devices. Or you can compare OpenGRS version <coughs> and Vulkan version of the same contents. For example, when porting from one, one API to another API, you can compare the performance anytime you need it. I will introduce one practice. This is our test-based project. In resolution WQHD, it takes about four or five frames per second to render the complex scene. And it takes about 200 milliseconds to render that scene. You can see the GPU shows that information. And GPU shows that it includes 14 render passes in it. We made one optimization for this project, barrier optimization. After this optimization, we got one FPS improved and reduced uh, about 30 milliseconds to render that frame. And when using GPU watch, you can notice that the render pass count is reduced from 14 to two render passes. Yeah. And we made one more optimization, multi-pass optimization. After this optimization, we got dramatically enhanced performance maximum 40 FPS, and rendering time is reduced to 10 times better than previous base project. And you can notice that the camera movement is smoother than previous two results. Actually, in, in our code lab, you can learn more in detail this practice and GPU watch tutorial. If you have interested in this practice, please visit our code lab and, and you will get a small gift when you visit our code lab. Finally, this is our roadmap. On Android P, we'll include GPU watch in Galaxy device, so you can use it on Galaxy device on Android P. We'll include these features that I explained till now. And for next to Android, we are planning adding more features for developers to optimizing their games.
frame drop information, FPS stability information, and capturing performance degradation candidate, not capturing arbitrary frame, and memory monitoring, selecting multiple games to watch, and bottleneck detection, and so on. We are investigating more features to help developers. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, hello. I am uh, Niklas Svendberg. Uh, but before I start talking about performance, because that's something I really care about, um, I'd like to know a little bit more about you. Uh, how many here are programmers? Hands up. And how many are artists and designers, UI designers, or business people, other? OK. All right. Cool. So I'm going to be talking about performance. And it's split up into three sections, CPU performance, GPU performance, and rendering performance. And that's kind of it right after that. You know everything. Um, but first, a little bit uh, about me. Uh, it may say Niklas Smedberg on my passport, but everyone knows me as Smedis. Um, so Smedis. If you say Niklas, I might not recognize that you're talking to me. Uh, I've been working as a, oh, not necessarily working, but I've been a graphics programmer for over 30 years, uh, back when it was starting to become possible to make graphics, so like on a Commodore 64, that kind of era. And I worked in the game industry <clears throat> with game development for over 20 years. These are, this is the first game that I worked on. That was for a PlayStation, the original PlayStation. So I started right off the bat with uh, uh, console uh, experience development. But then I worked on PC games, Xbox games. This game is... I'm not, didn't actually work on that game, but I'm in the game. <laughs> like the, the middle character there is modeled after me. <laughs> it was a different game team in the same company. Uh, some other games, uh, Unreal Tournament you have heard of, Gears of War you may have heard of. But then mobile started to come. And I got really interested because in, uh, I did, I've done consoles, I've done PCs, or I know that stuff. Mobile, something very new. So back from when I was working on the Commodore 64, it's a very limited device, restricted device. It's a big challenge to overcome. Consoles, they were already powerful, right? But with mobile, so sort of working on Infinite Blade, uh, made the graphics effects for that. Um, and since then, I've been doing a lot of mobile development after that. So more Infinite Blade stuff, more gears, yeah, stuff. Anyway, so I work at Unity, and at Unity, uh, our goal is to make a game development environment for all content creators. I mean, it is a game engine, but it's for all content creators, all content, um, and for all creators. So it's for artists. So an artist can pick up and use it right away. It's for designers, and it's for programmers. These are... Some of the games, it's very colorful, right? Yeah. At least the banner is colorful. Uh, some of the games made with Unity. Um, and if you look at the App Store, you look at the top 1,000 top mobile games, 40% um, of them are made with Unity. That's what's already installed, like what's published on the App Store. But if you look at like, what is currently being in development, uh, you can see that uh, a lot of developers are using Unity, 50%. And on uh, XR, VR, and AR, it's even more. It's pretty big numbers, but those are from 2017. And we've grown since then. All right, so a little bit uh, about the releases here. Um, I mean, this is a really, the, I promise this is the most boring slide. <laughs> um, the important thing here is um, that the version 2017.4 is an LTS version. Um, 
LTS means long-term support version. It's something that we promise that we're gonna keep supporting. If you use that version, we're gonna keep supporting that. With, uh, if there are any problems with it, we promise we will, uh, for a long time, we will uh, keep adding bug fixes and so on. You won't get any new features, but we'll make sure that that's like the most stable version of Unity. And then there's been newer versions with flashier features. Uh, the current version that is in beta now that is publicly available as a beta is 2018.3, uh, and we're currently working on uh, the 2019 versions. All right, so into performance, CPU performance. Whee! Did you see how fast I was, that 64-bit? It's really fast to see it again, you didn't notice. There, that's how fast 64-bit is. All right, <clears throat> so on the CPU side, I'm gonna talk about 64-bit. Why am I talking about 64-bit? Why did, like, uh, if you went to the previous talk, uh, Jungwoo was mentioning they were pushing 64-bit, like, why, okay? 64 is obviously more than 32, Got to be better, right? Um, so yes, it is more. You can make bigger games, and you can make uh, better graphics, because you can have uh, more data. You can address the, the, the pointers are 64-bit, right? So you can have larger textures and more data. Uh, you get more in another way. This is not commonly known, but this is the actual real reason why 64-bit is good you get more registers. The re Everyone is programmers, so um, cache misses is the worst thing you can have on a CPU. And if you have more register on the CPU, you don't have to go out to memory as often, because you have more registers that are kept on the CPU. Uh, it means that you can execute the instructions way more faster. That's great. That's a real benefit. Actually, that is the real benefit of S, uh, SIMD as well. Like any vector, okay, vectorized code is good, but actually you get more registers. That's a, uh, so that means faster. So you get, uh, with 64-bit, you get bigger, better, and faster. That's great. Also, you have to. <laughs> Google is requiring you to do 64-bit, so I guess that's a, I put it on the pros section. Okay, so on the cons, um, is it always better? Well, I mentioned that you get larger pointers. So that's good, but also on the cons side, why is that? Well, it means that your executable have lar using, is using larger, uh, uh, and your data is using uh, larger pointers. It means that your download size gets a little bit larger as well. Uh, it also means that the, uh, it's more to load, and not only just from uh, at startup time, you have more data to load to start the game, but at runtime, reading from memory, anytime you uh, read a variable or, or a data structure from memory, you need to read more memory. That means that the potential for cache misses is greater. And again, cache misses, that was the, that's a big killer on the CPU side. Actually, it's a big killer on the GPU as well, but. Uh, so, given the pros and cons, uh, Unity is supporting the 64-bit on Android, uh, and uh, we're gonna make sure that it will work with that LTS version that I mentioned before, uh, the long-term uh, support version. And we've been working on some things to overcome and address these, uh, the cons side, the larger size things, so that you guys, developers, only have to get the, the pros. You only get the benefits. So uh, we are adding support for Android app bundles, and that means that uh, in the App Store, when you download a game, you don't have to download the whole thing. It only downloads portions. It's like app binning. Uh, Games may have a 32-bit executable, a 64-bit executable, but when you download it, you only get the right one. So it goes faster to download for download size. Uh, we're working on addressable assets, and that is a more flexible way of downloading assets. 
Before uh, or currently, we have asset bundles. So you have a big package with a bunch of assets. You download the whole package that the game then uses the assets from. Um, but with addressable assets, you can use a single asset, and it downloads that asset from the cloud. It doesn't have to be organized into big uh, packages anymore. So only the assets you actually need are downloaded. I mentioned the... The other thing is uh, IL-2 CPP. I actually don't remember what that stands for. <laughs> Intermediate language to CPP or something? Oh, what is that? Um, actually, that is, first of all, uh, you should be using that. It's a great thing. <laughs> uh, it's not on by default. You have to click on it. Do that, please. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, compiling uh, script code uh, into native code. So it's actually running very, very efficient on the device. The executable compiled code of that uh, is going to be smaller, 2018.3. And I remember from the uh, previous, uh, one of the first slides, 2018.3 uh, is in beta right now. So you can try it out. All right, GPU performance. Is it going to be fast? Whee! Yes, Vulcan is fast. <laughs> um, it's, I, I think, the fastest setting in PowerPoint, so it is really fast at Vulcan. <clears throat> and yes, Unity supports Vulcan. Um, and the good thing with uh, Galaxy devices is that uh, it was also mentioned in the, in the previous session, Samsung is in the forefront of Vulcan development. It's with one of the first, I guess, the, the first mobile device that supported Vulcan and always been a strong supporter. So all Galaxy devices uh, from the conception of Vulkan supports Vulkan. Vulkan, so just a little bit of explanation. Uh, I mean, it's a rendering API, first of all. Uh, you, may, you, draw, you make draw calls and make graphics with it. But what it means is, uh, compared to uh, other rendering APIs, it means high quality. And the exact meaning of high quality here is that it has a rich feature set. Even the minimum spec, even with a 1.0 version, if you have a Vulkan device, you know that you have a, a basically console-like feature set. The, the minimum, uh, like minimum requirements level is extremely high, even from the start. It means that you don't have to, uh, there's no questions about can I do HD rendering or not? Does this device support, or do we, do we need to uh, make our game uh, in uh, gamma, gamma mode? All Vulkan devices support supports HDR. They all support compute shaders. Also a little high-end thing that, uh, and especially when, uh, I really like that John was said that they're pushing Vulkan to uh, mass market lower-end devices. It means that even mass market low-end devices is supporting compute shaders and HDR. Might be a little bit lower performance level, but at least when you're creating the content, you know that what you create is what the user is going to see. So Vulkan is high quality, is also high performance. Uh, and the reason for this is that it matches how GPUs work nowadays. With OpenGL, uh, OpenGL is really old, like before there were GPUs. <laughs> there's, no, there's no match in like the concepts in, in, in GL. It doesn't match what the hardware is doing at all. It's a completely black box mismatch. But in Vulkan, that API is uh, made to match exactly what the hardware is doing. That means there is a very low overhead. A Vulkan driver doesn't have to do as much as a GL driver. When you make a draw call in GL, the driver has to figure out what was the intention about this draw call and what are we actually supposed to do on the hardware. GL has a bunch of settings and functions that don't really match what the hardware is doing, so it has to do a lot of translation work to see what actually has to happen in reality. In Vulkan, the draw call says, do this and this. The driver goes, yeah, okay, do this and this. 
no minimum amount of translation being done. That means that it's much, much faster, right? Every draw call is much faster on the CPU. Uh, the third thing is Unity is focusing hard on Vulkan. Uh, I mean, you can imagine that, uh, I'm just saying that Vulkan is the way to go. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. Um, so recently, because we're focusing so hard on Vulkan, uh, there's been a lot of optimizations uh, overall across the board in Unity for Vulkan. And recently, we've done some internal measurements. And uh, not sure if it's uh, anyway, in an internal test, I uh, noticed that I just calculated what is the uh, difference uh, in the frame time. And it was 20 to 40% faster than uh, OpenGL ES on the CPU frame time. Quite dramatic. So it's better on the, on the, uh, on the CPU, so it's faster, okay, so that's good. Uh, but like, okay, our game is GPU bound, why do I care if I, uh, but you should care. You, even if you're GPU bound, you need to still be thinking about optimizing for the CPU. Because, and, and this is just on mobile, because mobile, when you think about mobile, um, some people see the difference between mobile, I mean, I call them computers, it's all computers, and the only difference is that it's tethered or non-tethered device. Does it have a power cable or not? But that's not the only difference. The, in my view, the big difference is that mobiles don't have a fan. They can't cool down. As a console or a PC or laptops, they have a fan to cool down. A mobile is, doesn't have that, and that's actually affecting your performance. Um, throttling. The, the clock frequency goes up and down all the time, and when the device heats up, it will slow down your device. So CPUs happen to generate a lot of heat, sometimes even more than the GPUs. Even if you have like, really advanced graphics and you're pushing it really hard, and you're doing some work on the CPU, the CPU may heat up the device more than what you're doing on the GPU, even if the GPU I mean, looks fancy on the screen. And if the CPU is heating up the device, then the device goes like, hey, we're heating up, we have to clock down, even with the GPU. So just because you're doing work on the CPU, it heats up the GPU too, and the GPU gets down clocked. So, Keep thinking about, and the same the other way around. If you're CPU bound, you should still, if you can do some optimization on the GPU, please do it anyway, even if you think that you, it's only the CPU that matters. All right, so throttling and annoying. Okay, so while Vulkan is really important in Unity, if you just launch, you download Unity, you make some stuff, and you launch it on your device, it will not run Vulkan. You have to actually do some manual settings. And it's not really easy to find in the manual. I checked yesterday. <laughs> so this is the way to do it. First of all, you have to go to the player settings um, for Android. And there's this uh, checkbox there for auto graphics API. It means that most games just leave it like that. So please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> this is the default setting to have it on. Auto, you know, auto graphics is, is good. It'll, but you have to disable it, that thing there. When you disable it, suddenly, oh, now you see the, uh, the rendering APIs. And now you can actually choose which uh, rendering APIs you're going to use. But wait, I just said that we supported Vulkan. It's not there, right? It just says OpenGL ES3 and ES2. You have to find that little button there. It's a plus sign. You have to click that button. There is the Vulcan. So there's the secret sauce uh, that I couldn't find in the manual. <laughs> you have to click that. All right. OK, now your game is good. We have Vulcan. Uh, not quite yet. Uh, you have to drag it to the top. Because that list of graphics API is not just like a random list of APIs. It's a priority order. Uh, we'll check in that order. And if a device, like previously, uh, if a device supports OpenGL ES3, it will use ES3. 
even if the device supported Vulkan, it wouldn't even check because it did support GL. So you have to make sure that you drag Vulkan to the top. And now everyone is happy. All right. Okay, so rendering performance. So Vulkan is great for uh, rendering performance, but uh, there's one more thing. Uh, SRP. Does everyone know what SRP is? Does it, and no one knows what SRP is? Uh, scriptable render pipeline. Um, parenthesis preview. Uh, so what is this? So normally in Unity, you download the binary, you have the binary game engine, you write your script code, and the renderer does what the renderer does. But with a scriptable render pipeline, SRP, you actually have full access to the renderer. It's basically, basically open source. In script, so it's in C sharp. Normally a renderer is like hundreds of CPP files, and when you compile them, it's lots and lots of lots of codes, page up and page down. Uh, but we have tried to make it very, very simple. Because in Unity, we want to make it simple uh, for developers to make great games. So SRP is not hundreds of files. It's not millions of lines of code. It's small. It's basically one function. That's it. In script, C sharp. Um, small also means that it's uh, uh, less things that can go wrong. <laughs> Um, it's user-centric, um, optimal, and very explicit. Since you have the source code for the render, uh, whatever you have in your uh, render, it means, first of all, that you can modify it, right? Customize it for exactly what you need to do. If you think that the built-in render in Unity is doing a little bit more than what you would want, and you want, you just comment that part out. And now your, your game is only rendering what you want it to render, and running at optimal frame rate. That's SRP, like one function. And you have full access to it. It's right there. You can just go in and uh, comment things out, change things around, write your own thing, especially on mobile, because mobile GPUs are tile renders, uh, which has uh, very specific, we talked about render passes. That's why GPU Watch has, shows all the render passes, and there were mention of uh, multipass in there. Those render passes are extremely important for mobile only, because they have tile-based GPUs. And with SRP, if you have a, a special need for, uh, that didn't sound so good, <laughs> special need for your game, if you have a particular way you want to render your uh, render passes uh, for your game, uh, you can customize it completely. Uh, for tile-based GPUs uh, on mobile. You know, we have the, the SRP. Uh, you don't have to write it from scratch. You just need to clarify that. You, just, you can use uh, a render pipeline that we have uh, made for you. But, and if you want, you can modify it. So we have two uh, rendering pipelines uh, that we have as a template. The lightweight one. Its uh, focus is on simplicity and awesome performance on all platforms. So that's the main uh, pipeline that you need to think about. The uh, HD render pipeline is focusing on uh, PBR. Does everyone know what PBR is? P okay, physically based rendering. It's uh, like fancy graphics that looks real. <laughs> It's like real materials, bark, rock stone. So HDRP, high definition rendering pipeline, is focusing on that kind of real, very, very realistic details and high-end graphics. Stuff that is important, like especially if you have devices with big screens, like movie theaters, <laughs> uh, PCs with big monitors, uh, consoles with uh, giant 60-inch TV screens that everyone has, of course. Um, so not necessarily for mobile with small screens. All right. Uh, the last thing um, that has to do with scriptable random pipeline, especially for all the artists in this room, uh, you don't have to be a programmer to write a shader. Uh, Unity is getting a shader graph editor. So instead of 
writing shaders. And just drag nodes around, and you'll see for each uh, subset, uh, each uh, part of your shader, you'll see an immediate preview of how that thing is going to look like. And then it combines all the way into the right-hand side. Now, uh, the thing with this is it is highly and tightly coupled with SRP. Because if you're writing, for example, and that's why I mentioned PBR before, if you're using a PBR uh, rendering pipeline, your shaders are going to be outputting PBR attributes, uh, which is quite different than if you have like a tomb shader uh, rendering pipeline, for example. So the uh, shader graph is only for SRP. It's not for the built-in render. And that is it. Do this, and you have great performance. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess before we go into questions, um, there is this slide <laughs> at the end. There's Apparently, if you do it four times, you get a prize. You get five points for each thing. Uh, it's basically like a little game, right? You can see it, uh, gamification. Um, I don't think we have questions. But anyway, it's questions time. Are you winning prizes? Is this the fourth? No, it's a question. OK, all right. I got a quick question. Um, yeah. I just want to know, what did you study in college? Oh, that is a good question, actually. I have actually a present, uh, a one hour presentation just on that. Like, what, how you could. <laughs> now, back, you know, when I started programming, so I, I said I was a graphics programmer for 30 years, but I had been a programmer for 40 years before that. You know, back at that time, before there were graphics, there were punch cards. You may have heard of that in the old school. You didn't code, a, you didn't program in, in languages. You, you had a, like a scissor and you punched holes for each bit on a paper, and you stuck that in a machine, and then after an hour, it ran the program. <laughs> um, so cut and paste back in that time was literally with scissor and tape. You cut the punch cards together and stick it in. Um, so back then, when uh, my college, there were very little good there was no game development courses, nothing like that. There were no graphics, computer graphics courses. I had to start one myself, my university. I started a computer graphics department. Um, so I didn't learn anything. <laughs> Everything is basically learned by myself. Uh, so I had to, in, in, in middle school, I had to start my own programming course in high school. C started coming, so I started a C programming course for the other kids. And yeah. Unfortunately, nowadays I'm really jealous. <laughs> There's so much fun stuff to learn in college today. Um, so I don't have a, a good suggestion for today. But <laughs> yeah, there are uh, microphones uh, coming around. Um, what's a good way for someone who develops native apps in Java or Swift? to make a jump and start making games in, in Unity? What's, what's the recommendation? Yeah, that is also, there's like a, actually that requires more than an hour uh, presentation. Um, so, well, a, a fun thing is here, uh, there is an important guy in the audience that you can hijack <laughs> and call you out, Scott. That's the <laughs> director of mobile uh, development in Unity. Yes, yeah, so there's, there's loads of learning content on our website. That's a great place to start. And we even do like live um, training sessions on the internet. And then, of course, the, we have conferences and stuff with, with additional training. But one of the great things about uni is there's, there's a huge community. So there's a lot of support to get started. And if you're familiar with like JavaScript, it's, it's C sharp. So it's not too big of a jump from a coding. And I, I want to point out uh, the cool thing some, because some, I haven't been at Unity all my life, right? But what I really like about Unity, is it is extremely quick to get started. Like the, uh, the fact that the game code is in C Sharp, C Sharp compiles ex extremely fast. It's like you make a change, hit enter, and it's already running in your game on the screen. It's pretty amazing that way. And uh, so uh, a really easy way is to, uh, there's a little uh, YouTube series to make a game. 
download some assets and, and uh, starting code, and throughout, like, it takes you four hours or something, go through all the YouTubes, you made a game in Unity. I did that. It was pretty, I love, love it. I still love it, that, uh, <laughs> that game <laughs> that you make that. Because it goes through the whole thing. It, it has a whole full game loop. It has a, a multiplayer uh, PC. But um, you can get started really quick like that. Lots of lots of training and tutorials. And everything, all the steps that you do are extremely quick. There's no like compiling, uh, packaging, everything is already done. You just download Unity, look at the YouTube, oh, do, 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 done. Next question. I actually had a question for the GPU watch. Yeah. Um, so I obviously, every real time, you know, debugging tool or you know, profiling tool is gonna have some overhead. So I guess my question was, do you have like a measurement of like the overhead GPU watch has currently? Just keep talking and turn up the volume. Yep. Uh, your question means the GPU watch causes some overhead? Overhead, if there's overhead. Uh, yeah, like, GPU so watch. GPU, if you have an app that's like running at like, you know, 50 frames per second, and now I enable GPU watch, there's gonna have, to, there's gonna be some overhead. I mean, that's just assumed. Like any profile and tool will have some overhead. I was just wondering if you knew how much overhead GPU watch adds when it's running. Yes, uh, during our implementation, implementation, we checked the overhead when the GPU watch is running, but we figure out that there is not much overhead. So we can ignore that overhead, uh, uh, very little. Yeah. Uh, I, ca I cannot uh, exact data, but there is no overhead. Okay. I, just from a, uh, so I, I would count myself as a developer like you, so I would be like in the audience asking questions. So you could uh, consider the measurements that GPU Watch is doing is, is really quick on the CPU and GPU. There's like, on the GPU, there's no overhead for doing the measurements. On the CPU, it's like just a couple of instructions per frame. I would imagine without knowing anything. Um, so the overhead would be the rendering the UI, but that cannot be much, I think. Hi, quick question. Um, you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that Unity was a platform for all creators. Um, most of uh, the features that you focused on have been targeted towards the gaming community. Can you talk a little bit about um, some of the faster growing communities and or use cases outside of gaming and how your latest releases have um, evolved to maybe be more attractive for these audiences of new developers? Yeah, so uh, the, uh, one of the beginning slides was uh, VR and AR is one good example, especially because Unity is so prevalent and common on VR and AR. And uh, the, the obvious uh, answer is first, anything that would need some kind of real time or visualization uh, capabilities would benefit from uh, Unity. And, all VR and all AR apps need that. So for any VR, any AR, doesn't matter what, uh, if it's like a, a training tool, if it's like uh, architecture, visualis any kind of visualization um, would benefit immediately. Uh, then there's, uh, besides AR and VR, like 100% of AR and VR can use it, just today, immediately. Um, other things that is not uh, AR and VR, that would still need a lot of uh, graphics, um, not necessarily real time, uh, things like uh, TV and movie creation. Um, I would like to use Unity for, instead of PowerPoint, I would like to use Unity as a presentation tool for all the animations, because PowerPoint could only move that Android logo so fast on the screen, Unity would be much faster. Um, uh, Scott, do you have anything to add? Right. There's, there's, uh, so I, I talk about, like, you can, you, you're immediately thinking about like uh, visual things, right? But it doesn't have to be anything that even runs through the screen. Sim anything that has uh, simulation is useful. Anything that uses AI, 
anything that uses, um, uh, well, simulation stuff uh, that, that could be running on the servers. Um, and, well, it would be nice to be able to see the results of the simulation at some point, but <laughs> it's not real time. Uh, would benefit from uh, Unity. And, of course, uh, while Unity, you know, the primary focus is, is game development, uh, we're still lo looking at um, other opportunities as well where we can help because it's, it's a de development environment right, that is fast to iterate on. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that Vulkan is the way to go on mobile. Is it the same way in all devices? Uh, you always prefer Vulkan? Um, the way to go means that uh, not where you were before. <laughs> so devices that were before, like, forget about them. <laughs> where to go is where all the devices are going to go, and they're all going to be Vulkan. So basically, it's just a matter of time. Like, I could say today that I use Vulkan across everywhere, or I can you know, come back in two years, and at that time, there would be, there's no, no questions about it. Uh, the thing is with development, game development can take, takes some time. So if you start developing something today, when you release the devices out there that you're going to be actually running on, they're all Vulkan devices. All of them, like even the low-end ones. All right. Thank you very much.